Looks like uh, we've got a large crowd here tonight. Um, on behalf of Glockos, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. And welcome to you to our webinar to discuss our Keratoconus Data Registry Program called IDTech KC and our collaboration with TopCon Medical. My name is Norman Sue. I'm the Director of National Council for Coronial Health for Glockos. Before we start, I wanted to pass on some relevant information. We wanted to ensure that all your questions and answers uh, have been enabled uh, in the question and answer function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during the webinar, and we'll aim to answer them at the very end. Because we're using the Q&A function, the chat function will be disabled. So in summary, please use the Q&A and not the chat functions to submit your questions. Also note that this webinar is being recorded so that we can make this information more accessible following the conclusion of this program. I am pleased to introduce our speaker to you this evening. Joining us is Dr. Mitch Eibach. Dr. Mitch Eibach is an optometrist at Vance Thompson Vision in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He specializes in interior segment surgical care, including cataracts, corneal diseases, glaucoma, and refractive surgery. He graduated magna cum laude from North Dakota State University with a degree in microbiology. He then went on to the Pacific Northwest to attend Pacific University College of Optometry, where he graduated summa cum laude. Dr. Eibach has years of experience in the diagnosis of keratoconus and corneal ectasia following refractive surgery and was a sub-investigator at Vidro's FDA clinical trials. Without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Mitch Eibach. Thanks so much, Norm. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for jumping on tonight. Tonight is week four of the Vision, our Vance Thompson Vision educational series. And since I didn't get the necessary votes to make it to the semifinals or the finals, which is this week, thanks for massaging my ego, jumping on and spending 30 to 45 minutes to discuss keratoconus management with us. Keratoconus management is much different now in 2020 than it was in 2010 or even 2015. Keratoconus used to be a disease of just really monitoring. We kind of sat back, we monitored these patients, maybe gave them some optical rehabilitation, and then just crossed our fingers and prayed that these patients didn't go on to severe vision loss and need for a full thickness cornea transplant. But in 2020, keratoconus has become a much more interventional disease. This really came about in 2016 with the FDA approval of epithelium off corneal crosslinking. We can now be more interventional, more proactive with these patients. Two major tenants in our keratoconus management algorithm really should be early diagnosis and then early intervention with treatment to halt or stop progression. We're going to focus in on these two things tonight. For compliance reasons, here's the indications for corneal collagen crosslinking for progressive keratoconus and refractive surgery ectasia. Corneal crosslinking is contraindicated in pregnant females, mostly because riboflavin just wasn't studied in the FDA clinical trials. And second, at this time in the US, corneal collagen crosslinking is off label or non approved for infectious or ulcerative keratitis. Moving forward to the disclaimer, this is an industry sponsored event. So tonight you'll get to hear my opinions, my experiences, and some of my knowledge with keratoconus management as well as corneal crosslinking. Financial disclosures, I am a industry paid consultant and speaker for Glacos. I do have some other industry partnerships which are non-relevant for tonight's educational event. And so here's kind of the lay of the land. Tonight we are going to define keratoconus. We'll give you an overview of what the patient type looks like. We'll go into early diagnosis. How do we make our first tenant now of 2020 keratoconus management with making that early diagnosis? How do we as eye care providers stop or halt this irreversible cause of vision loss and blindness? Hopefully we'll give you a few pearls on interventional approaches, how to treat this progressive vision loss. We're going to talk about FDA approved corneal collagen crosslinking. And then encircling early diagnosis, we're going to introduce the iDetect KC data registry, which is a partnership between TopCon and a corneal topographer, as well as Glacos. This program is really targeted at primary optometrists, optometrists just like you and I on this call, getting topographies in our hands so that we can better take care of our keratoconus patients. I really like this as an overview slide of keratoconus. Keratoconus is a serious eye disease that can lead to serious irreversible vision loss and a last resort surgically of being a penetrating keratoplasty or a full thickness cornea transplant. 
the National In Institute of Health in the US, which is a much older study now, 1986, estimated the prevalence of keratoconus in the US at less than one in 1,000 patients. Hashemi et al. recently in Cornea published a worldwide systematic review and meta-analysis of keratoconus worldwide. So taking everyone into account here, reviewed all these big literature studies and articles and found a prevalence of about one in 750 patients. If you do country by country analysis, kind of breaking this up in 2017, a study out of the Netherlands found keratoconus at one in 375 patients. And most recently, the RAIN study, which was a birth cohort, a group of patients in Australia at birth were then brought back over 20 years later. These patients were given a Pentacam with Balin Ambrosio Advanced Diagnostics. And this study in Australia found keratoconus in one in 84 patients. This is by far the highest prevalence of studies ever found. And an interesting key from that study is only about one out of 15 patients knew they had keratoconus coming in to that study. And the reason I bring all these prevalence studies up is because incidence is rising and awareness is rising. Both of those keys are important because we can hopefully get to patients sooner and treat them earlier. We all know keratoconus most commonly presents in the late teens to early 20s, progresses sometime around 30 years, and then starts to plateau off. The cornea starts to cross-link itself, but we don't know that magic number when the cornea is going to cross-link itself. I think cross-linking is so important because going to a full thickness cornea transplant is really the patient's last resort from a healing standpoint, but it also costs a lot of healthcare dollars. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, a full thickness cornea transplant for keratoconus costs healthcare system about twenty dollars to $50,000 per full thickness cornea transplant. If you then couple that with the Australian Graft Registry study, which was done on patients with keratoconus in Australia, first cornea transplants, they looked at corneal graft failure. And what they found is for various reasons, a cornea transplant on average, just over 50% of them had failed by 20 years postoperatively. This means if we do a full thickness PKP in a patient who's 20 or 30, he or she is going to need two, more likely three transplants throughout his or her lifetime. And despite all the facts of vision loss, risk of rejection, removing the sutures, high irremediable astigmatism, we're building a lot of healthcare dollars here. And I think this, these two studies couple nicely for a strong indication and a reinforcement of the importance of corneal collagen cross-linking. What is the US market for keratoconus? A 2000 registry study predicted at minimum in the US, we have 800,000 patients with keratoconus. The Collaborative Longitudinal Evaluation of Keratoconus Study or CLEC study, which was an optometry led study. So tap yourself or give yourself a pat on the back for that said that 96% of keratoconus is bilateral. We have 800,000 patients, almost all of them are bilateral. We have 1.6 million eyes in the US, 34,000 new eyes or patients are diagnosed with keratoconus per year. Optometrists are really the gatekeeper, going to be the first person seeing all types of eye pathology, and keratoconus is no different here. 70% of patients with keratoconus are currently residing in optometric practices and practices like yours and mine. Patient reported symptoms in many ways, keratoconus is like glaucoma. Patients throughout the disease usually don't have any pain unless we have acute corneal hydrops. For visual symptoms for our patients, boy, it has to get into the moderate, moderate to severe stages before patients are going to lose vision. Early on, patient symptoms are very, very low, and that just raises the importance of having scans for these patients. Through this list, some of the important ones for me here for patient symptoms is going to be a warping of vision, patients starting to kind of see ghosting or tails on letters, some of the street signs, yearly fluctuations in their manifest refraction. So if you're seeing an increase in astigmatism every year on refraction, an increase in the myopic spherical equivalent, again, these are patients who I really think need some type of topographic or tomographic scan. During the case history that we all are going to do, this is a really important point to pause and ask about mechanical eye rubbing. Patients rubbing, touching, pressing on their eyes, I believe is the number one modifiable risk factor for keratoconus. We want patients to stop rubbing their eyes and educate them on the importance of that. Also dig deeper on why they're rubbing their eyes. Is it some type of allergic conjunctivitis? Is it a patient with floppy lids? Is it a Down syndrome patient where patients 
those subgroup of patients really have the inability to not rub touch press on their eyes. And so how do we help them? Moving to the clinical signs of keratoconus, I believe that topography is so important for these patients, but if you currently don't have a topography or tomography in your practice, can you still be a master of taking care of keratoconic patients? And I think the answer is yes. I think some of these tools are really going to give us our first red flags. This is going to give us a, a possible diagnosis or put keratoconus on the list. And then the topography and tomography can come back and make that definitive diagnosis. First, looking at keratometry and autokeratometry, moving that drum manually back and forth, spinning the dials it almost seems archaic now, but you can see these images to the right here. If you start to see distortion on the Myers, things just aren't lining up. This should be an early clue. If you have an autokeratometer and you're getting an error message, this is another clue of corneal ectasia or an abnormality. And then just an auto K, a keratometry value of 52, 53, this is most commonly going to be abnormal. Remember 43 to 43 and a half is our normal K. Once you start to see 10 diopter steeper than that, something just isn't adding up for me here. A second tool that you all have in your practice is retinoscopy, moving that slit image back and forth across the patient's pupil and cornea to get an objective refraction, but we can also look at how that reflex looks. What's the quality of the reflex? If you start to see distortion, that pathognomonic scissoring reflex, this is a great way to diagnose keratoconus. There's a study published in Cornea that looks at retinoscopy compared to pentacam tomography using Balin Ambrosio Advanced Keratoconic Diagnostics. And what the study found is for diagnosing keratoconus, retinoscopy had a 98% sensitivity. If, if keratoconus is there, retinoscopy caught it almost 100% of the time and a 78% specificity, meaning if retinoscopy said keratoconus, that was the diagnosis. And this is approaching really pentacam tomography, which many studies use as the gold standard here. And then third is the foropter. We all spend a lot of time in optometry school learning how to refract patients, learning how to make a pristine glasses prescription. Things need to add up here though. If you're starting to see a one diopter increase of astigmatism in a one year period, you're seeing a half diopter increase in myopia, or just a patient who isn't correctable to 2020 and was the year or two years previous, this is a patient that I really think needs a topographic scan. A good clinical exam at the slit lamp is so important in all of our eye pathologies and keratoconus is really no different here. We're looking for things like a Fleischer's ring, Voigt striacing, small little cracks in our patient's cornea, stromal thinning, stromal scars, enlarged corneal nerves, Munson sign if a patient looks down and the lower eyelid pooches out. This is one of the hallmark signs of keratoconus. And then acute corneal high drops. Remember high drops is a break in Decimase membrane. You can see that picture to your bottom right that break in the back of the cornea here. When that happens, there's going to be a fluid rush. Aqueous is going to rush into the cornea, cause corneal edema. Patient's vision drops off really quickly. Over time, the edema is going to clear, but it's going to leave behind a big resultant scar. And so we are gonna do some poll questions tonight, hopefully to get some interaction with you all. And so using a slit lamp as the primary tool for keratoconus diagnosis is tough. And what is our big concern here? What's the problem with using the slit lamp? Is it A, we have variability per exam, B, patients already lost uncorrected visual acuity and often best corrected, it's hard to compare right eye and left, or the brightness causes photophobia for our patient. So if we can start that poll, please. Hopefully everyone's able to get their votes in. We can close it here in about five seconds. Yeah, and so almost 50% of you said a patient has already lost uncorrected visual acuity and oftentimes best corrected acuity. And that's the answer I was really looking for. There's definitely variability per exam in these patients. Comparing right eye and left can be tough, but really if we're diagnosing keratoconus at the slit lamp, we're seeing some of the signs on the previous slide. This is a patient who's already lost for sure uncorrected visual acuity. This is a patient who's in the moderate to late stages of keratoconus, especially if we have things like high drops and corneal scars. And so let's move forward to topography. We said that we have tools in our practices that can give us the initial red flags, but I believe for the definitive diagnosis and for monitoring patients over time, looking for 
progression or halting a progression, being able to freeze these corneas in place, topography is such a key in managing this disease. Topography is really an elevation map. You can see the scans on the bottom here, the warmer the color, or some of them have a, a label, the higher that color is on that bar graph, the steeper the area of cornea is going to be. What we're looking for in a healthy cornea is going to be that dumbbell shape or eight infinity sign. And we want it to be symmetric between the superior and inferior cornea. And you can see some examples here of a topography that just isn't normal. We have some different ectasia or keratoconus appearances on these topographies here. The topography tells us the anterior corneal shape, symmetry, tells us the curvature, gives us our keratometry values, K1 and K2, which is also going to tell us then the corneal astigmatism. Let's look at some of our advanced diagnostic imaging tools for keratoconus. We talked about topography. This is going to give us the anterior corneal shape and elevation, similar to a topographic land elevation map shown to your bottom right. We're just looking for hills and valleys. A tomography, most commonly going to be Pentacam now, analyzes both the anterior cornea as well as the posterior cornea. Posterior cornea is often the first place that the cornea bulges forward for our keratoconic patients, and so it can give us an early tip. And a tomography also gives us a corneal pachymetry map, so it maps out the thickness of the cornea, which can be helpful as well. Looking at epithelial mapping, this is mapping just the 50 microns, give or take, of the anterior cornea, that first layer of the cornea. There's been studies that have now shown that in patients with keratoconus, the epithelium is going to thin over the area of the cone and then will thicken around the cone. And so maybe epithelial mapping in the future leads us to pre-topographic keratoconus. And then anterior segment OCT. Many of you have a posterior segment OCT for the nerve as well as the macula. You can often just add on the anterior segment module, which can give us that detailed cross-section of the cornea looking for bending or warping of that beam, that printout shown here. I believe so strongly in the best practices of keratoconus management, really focusing on early diagnosis because as these patients progress, the disease gets harder and harder to manage, as well as we're losing refractive options. Our refractive toolbox to rehabilitate vision is getting smaller for these patients. Once they get to moderate to severe disease, once they definitely have scarring, it becomes a much harder and more challenging disease. As you all know, refraction in a keratoconic patient can change on the daily, and so refracting these patients using glasses alone can be really tough. If we're only using optical devices to treat patients with keratoconus like glasses, soft contact lenses, specialty contact lenses, even intact intrastromal ring segments, we can mask some of the vision loss, we can rehabilitate the vision, but we're not stopping the progression of this disease. It's going to continue to worsen and there's lots of studies that show the corneal thinning and steepening will just progress in these patients. And so traditionally, many have used visual management solutions, but unfortunately it doesn't stop disease progression. What does is corneal collagen cross-linking using riboflavin and ultraviolet light with oxygen to stiffen the cornea, to add strength and change the biomechanics of that cornea, halting disease progression. And the good news here is we do have an FDA approved option for epithelium off corneal cross-linking. Let's dive into that procedure. If you look at the framework of corneal cross-linking, this is really a chemical reaction that needs three ingredients. First, we need riboflavin or vitamin B2. This is our photosensitizer. We have this in the FDA approved options of Fotrexa viscous and Fotrexa. This is going to get soaked onto the cornea, soaks into the deep stroma. And then we add ultraviolet light, UVA light at a wavelength of 365 to 370. That's shown onto the cornea. And then we need oxygen. These three ingredients are going to cause a chemical reaction to strengthen and freeze that cornea into place. Oxygen is like the catalyst that makes the reaction run. The difference between Fotrexa viscous and Fotrexa, Fotrexa is a hypotonic solution. So when needed, and we'll show that in the slide coming up, we can swell the cornea, make the cornea thicker before we put the ultraviolet light on. Corneal collagen cross-linking is a medical procedure that aims to halt the progression of an ectatic or bulging forward cornea. This generates, when we add UV light 
plus riboflavin, this is going to create singlet oxygen and free radicals and form these covalent bonds or what you see to your left as, excuse me, your right as crosslinks. The more singlet oxygen we can make, the more crosslinks and covalent bonds, more crosslinks equals a stronger cornea. Corneal collagen crosslink linking creates new collagen crosslinks, results in a shortening and thickening of the collagen fibrils, as well as stiffens the cornea. And so let's show the procedure here. This is really the six steps of corneal collagen crosslinking, how we're doing it right now. Step number one is to remove the epithelium. Very similar to PRK, we remove the epithelium. We all know that the epithelium is a good barrier to drugs, to lasers, to ultraviolet light as well. Step number two, we're gonna soak the cornea with riboflavin. We're putting riboflavin drops onto the cornea for 30 minutes. We wanna soak those into the deep stroma. And then we're looking for flare. Flare is going to be that riboflavin shown throughout the cornea. And you start to see a yellow green haze in the anterior chamber at the slit lamp. We then check the intraoperative pachymetry. We want that to be greater than 400 microns. And really the concern here is protecting the endothelial cells. And so an interoperative pachymetry is performed. If needed, Fotrexa can be used to swell the cornea to get to that level. And then we're irradiating the cornea. Ultraviolet light goes on to the eye for 30 minutes. We are still adding riboflavin to that patient's cornea. And then the final step, very similar again to PRK, is to put on a bandage contact lens. And so let's look at some data. What's the efficacy say for corneal crosslinking? This is data from Avedro's phase three FDA clinical trial, which is published in ophthalmology. This is over 200 eyes with progressive keratoconus. Half of patients got corneal crosslinking, half of patients were monitored, and they ran this trial for 12 months. That was the duration of the study. And the primary endpoint was the change in Kmax at one year. And for this to be FDA approved, they had to prove to the FDA a greater than one diopter difference in the patients who are crosslinked compared to the patients who are monitored. You can see on the left, this is for progressive keratoconus. The treated group shown on your left at six months had 1.1 and at 12 months had 1.6 diopters of flattening compared to the control group who steepened one diopter. Zero is our neutral line there for Kmax. And so it's a 2.6 diopter difference in patients who are cross-linked compared to patients who are monitored. On the right for corneal ectasia, similar here, we have patients who are cross-linked flattened, patients who are the control group steepened, and it was a 1.4 diopter difference in patients who are cross-linked compared to patients who are controlled. Now, when we're setting expectations for our patients, we're freezing the cornea into place. I tell patients, we want to keep you exactly where you are now. But the truth is, in the FDA clinical trials, the average patient in both keratoconus and refractive surgery ectasia had flattening of the cornea, the corneal shape improved. So let's go to our next poll question here. Which of the following is true regarding insurance coverage and cross-linking? About another 10 seconds here. Yeah, perfect. That one was a little bit of a softball. Whenever someone gives you all the above, that's the answer they want you to pick so they can talk about each of the other answers. And so the FDA approved eye link cross-linking procedure, epithelium off, is well covered by our insurance. And we're going to show that. Insurance companies do want to show progression. So we have to show progressive keratoconus or progressive refractive surgery ectasia, and there is no global period. And so cataract surgery, we're billing post-operative visits. There isn't that global period with corneal cross-linking. And so you want to bill office visits, most commonly for me, a 99213 or a 92012. And so let's look at insurance coverage here. As the evidence grows for corneal cross-linking, insurance coverage has gotten better and better and better. In 2017, three commercial carriers were providing reimbursement or coverage for corneal cross-linking. Now, 96% of primary insured patients have reimbursement or insurance coverage for corneal cross-linking. This is a heat map here, courtesy of Glacos. The darker the green color, the better the insurance coverage or more carriers in that area. And now in all states, there's at least six different coverages for this. And so insurance coverage has gotten much, much better. This was a mountain to climb in 2016 when 
Crosslinking was initially approved by the FDA, but now it's widely available for your patients. Livingwithkeratoconus.org as well as Glacos have partnered. And so if you have a patient with a deductible and copay, there's a $100 coupon through the end of the year to go towards that. They also have the ARCH program for patients who are underserved, uninsured, maybe Medicaid patients. They can get the drug at no cost, as well as they have surgical centers across the country who will do cross-linking at no charge for these patients who maybe really need it. And so let's move forward. Let's move into the iLink TopCon collaboration and introduce the CA800 corneal topography. This is a collaborative program between Glacos and TopCon. This is a placido disc topographer. It's a standalone device, meaning you do not need a PC to connect to this. It has all of that built in. It's also going to give us some different corneal higher order aberrations like coma, trefoil, spherical aberration, and it's a simple plug and play device. In this program, they're offering it for optometrists in their office at $8,990. There is a warranty on this device. And in this program, as an optometrist, if you choose to join, there's a data registry to try to get patient results in as well, which we'll talk more about and we'll cover. So as I said, this is a placido disc topographer. You can see the screen shown to your left on the device and then some of the printouts shown to your right. This topographer does have built-in analysis for specialty contact lens fits and fluorescein analysis. And so it can give us a first best fit lens for patients, which can be really helpful for some of our specialty contact lens fits. The device, again, also measures corneal higher order aberrations, which we use a lot for keratoconus patients, but also for some of our cataract surgery post refractive cataract surgery patients as well. Let's work through the CA800 for the keratoconus analysis here. There's really four big numbers or quantitative results that it gives us. First is the apical keratometry. This is going to be your steepest corneal point. This is your K-max. Max keratometry is very commonly quoted in a lot of our keratoconus studies. It also helps in showing progression. Apical gradient of curvature. This is just the rate of change across a patient's cornea. The superior to inferior asymmetry. This is a big one to me. It's most commonly at the five millimeter ring. You're looking at the steepest point of the superior cornea compared to the inferior cornea. And if the inferior cornea is two diopter steeper or more than the superior cornea, this is highly indicative of a patient with keratoconus. And then finally, the keratoconus probability index. The machine does all the work, takes all the numbers, and then spits out a percentage risk or the percent chance that this patient has keratoconus. It does all the analysis for you. Continuing with some scans here on your left, this is a keratoconus analysis giving us that probability index score here. You can see this is a topography that's highly compatible with keratoconus. And on the right, then this is the full quantitative printout that we see. We see our K values, corneal decentration. We see AD, which are different numbers, all going into that keratoconus probability index. You can see this is definitely here a scan of a patient who has an abnormal anterior corneal curvature and a patient with keratoconus. This is the 3D view of corneal elevation. Boy, this almost reminds me of our black and white printout on a visual field where we just use that for patient education. I think this is really cool here. The 3D view might also help for some of your specialty contact lens fits, but I think it's mostly a tool for patient education, just looking at that topographic or elevation map again. This scan and image right here, this is arguably the most important printout for me. This is going to be your comparison map. So we're able to compare topographies over time, serial analysis to look for progression for patients. This comparison map being able to show what 2018 versus 2019 looked like for patients is extremely important for showing progression, looking at rate of change. It's also important if a patient's had corneal crosslinking to say, yep, we stabilized this cornea, we froze it into place. It's important for insurance and reimbursement as well. And so let's ask you guys another question. How does this technology fit into your practice currently? Are you currently fitting specialty contact lenses? Do you currently have a mybographer to assess meibomian gland health? Do you currently measure non-invasive tear breakup time or look at fluorescein for specialty contact lens fits? Two of the above or all of the above. And we can go ahead and show the results there. This is just really to get a lay of the land of where we're at right now. So a lot of you are fitting specialty contact lenses. A lot have 
a way to measure non-invasive tear breakup time in fluorescein as well. And so tonight I'm preceding Kirk Mack, who is one of the national leaders in billing and coding. And so I'll take a first stab at this, but these are some questions that you can, of course, ask to him as well. He's the expert here, but there is a billable component to being able to do topography in your office. It has a CPT code of 92025, some of the covered diagnoses, but just a small snapshot are shown below, the big one with keratoconus, irregular astigmatism. When billing this, you can see the CPT code for Medicare reimburses at just about $40 for a topography. And then Blue Cross Blue Shield, this is from our area, so the South Dakota network or some of our Blue Cross Blue Shield insurances reimburses at just over $80. And so primary insurance reimburses at about $80 for doing this corneal topography. You can do this pre, you can do this post corneal cross-linking. Again, helpful for the patient, but also hopefully can be helpful for the practice. In the poll question, I previewed some of the other technologies that this CA800 topographer has. First with non-invasive tear breakup time, you can see that on the top right, being able to see how the tear film's breaking up. You can also use this for your specialty contact lens fits. For me, having the ability to have a topographer or a tomographer give me the first lens to put on a patient's eye, making specialty contact lens fits more of a mathematical equation rather than trial and error has been really helpful for efficiency. And then on the bottom right, it also has a built-in mybographer. So we can look at the quality of the mybomian glands. And for me in dry eye, this is probably my favorite thing to show patients because getting them to buy into the evaporative component of dry eye, why they're watering is really, really helpful, this education piece here. We know that over 80% of dry eye is a combined mechanism dry eye that has an evaporative component. So adding mybography can be really important for a practice as well. And so we're gonna work through a quick case here, just showing how a patient came into our practice and we utilize tomography and tomography, topography for this patient to really be able to diagnose and then monitor his keratoconus here. So this is a 14 year old Caucasian male, a boy sent into our practice, probably from one of you on our webinar tonight, right eye pentacam shown to your right. He had an uncorrected acuity of 2020, best corrected to 2020 plus with plus a quarter sphere, pachymetry of 531 and he's an eye rubber in that right eye. If we look at these four scans here, top left is your axial curvature or sagittal curvature map maybe a little bit of asymmetry, the inferior to superior ratio right around two, has a pretty average corneal pachymetry and it's centered, maybe early changes on the posterior float. How many of you are raising your hand right now and saying, we got to cross-link this cornea right away? This is now the left eye. Left eye uncorrected 2400, plus three minus 350 at 95, 493 for a pachymetry and definitely an eye rubber. This scan on the left is definite keratoconus for me. Remember, 96% of keratoconus is bilateral. And so what we decided to do is cross-link the left eye with epithelium off cross-linking right away. And then we closely monitored that right eye. And so you can see here on the left, 2018 pentacam shown on the left, 2019 on the right, able to have that serial analysis here. And really, this is a very stable patient after corneal cross-linking. We actually flattened the K-max just slightly. And so this patient went from 57.6 down to 54.7. And so this is a great outcome for this 14-year-old boy. Let's shift back to the right eye now. This is 2018 to 2019. K-max has stayed about the same. The pachymetry is the same. And the posterior float is the same. And so again, in 2018 to 2019, we said, we're just going to monitor for now. We again have this patient back and here's the progression comparing 18 to 19 to now 20. You can see the K max has went from 43.5 to 44.6. Corneal astigmatism has risen. We had a refraction of plus a quarter and now we have minus a half minus 25. So uh, minus 0.67 for a myopic change and increase in that spherical equivalent. And so we decided at this point, we're gonna move forward and we've since cross-linked this right eye with epithelium off corneal cross-linking. This case just highlights astute ODs like yourself. You're probably going to see the change on refraction and you might say, wait a minute, something's not right here. But I think this case highlights how topography over time really unlocked the first sign of progression and we were able to cross-link this right eye. This is a patient who is still uncorrected 2015 
after cross-linking. And so let's co close with discussing the iDetect KC data registry. This is a part of this partnership between Glacos and TopCon. The objective here is to, within regulatory, legal, and HIPAA considerations, be able to create a mega registry of patients with keratoconus, both patients who are pre-corneal cross-linking as well as patients who are post-corneal cross-linking. The registry and data set can then be critically analyzed. There can be peer-reviewed journal articles that come out of this. There can be peer-to-peer -peer education and hopefully just continue to raise awareness for patients showing the importance of corneal cross-linking and highlighting keratoconus and early diagnosis. The goal is to be able to put these topographic scans into primary care optometrist's hands so that more patients have the ability to get topography. And I really like these four bullet points shown to the top left here. 95% of patients with keratometry greater than 45 and astigmatism greater than two diopters Okay, max difference of greater than two diopters between eyes or an inability to autorefract are highly suspicious are going to be at least a keratoconus suspect. The goal here is to be able to input these scans to have quarterly scans that are input for our patients so that we can get more data on the efficacy of corneal cross-linking, the importance of early treatment, how does a patient who's 18 versus a patient who's 38 change in corneal keratometry values. And so having all of us input this data will only lead to better awareness in these patients. These patients are de-identified and so the scans are all within HIPAA guidelines. And it's something that you can do in your practice and in your office. And so with that, guys, I want to close. I want to say again, thank you so much for joining tonight. I want to give a quick plug for our Vance Thompson Vision, the Vision Educational Series. The finale is going to be Thursday night, and hopefully there'll be some fireworks on who wins the whole event. Hopefully in this last kind of 30 to 45 minutes, I gave you guys two to three pearls that you can better now take care of your keratoconus patients with, maybe learn something about corneal cross-linking as well. Educating in front of peers that are in kind of our network who I get to see at some of our local meetings is just such an honor for me. I have a lot of respect for you guys. So thanks again for joining tonight. I'm going to turn it over to my friends at Glacos. But before I do, for more information on the iDetect KC program, there is the email there. If you want to get a hold of someone and bring this technology into your practice, that's the first way you can do it. If you do have a distributor for TopCon devices, they're not offering kind of this partnership. And so you really want to work through this team here. And hopefully my Glacos uh, friends can jump on and answer some of the questions that you have. Thanks, Dr. Ibog. Um, do we have time for one quick question? We have time for a lot of questions, hopefully. Okay. So we got uh, Dr. Asman. He's, I don't know if you see the questions here, but when seeing teens with certain KC risk factors like FHXKC, Yep. Rubbing eyes or not getting 2020 ruled out all other medical issues. Each eye would, what, what do you recommend to do with a patient like this? Yeah, for this patient here, if you don't have a topography in your practice, I would find a, a partner, an optometrist in your area, hopefully maybe an ophthalmologist in your area that has the ability to get a corneal elevation map, a topography or a tomography, but don't hesitate to refer that patient out because this is someone, you've given me three or four things here that I said, yep, I want a topography on that patient. If you don't have one in your practice and you're not ready to get one yet, find a partner who you can get a scan with that you can refer out to. I'll kind of jump to the next one here. What patient data are they looking for and how is it done? Uh, Norm, if you're willing, I'm going to let you kind of answer that one. Yeah, based on this study, we you outlined the risk factors on those patients we want to go ahead and do the topography on. Of the ones that are flagged with those um, keratoconus algorithms, uh, as long as the device is networked, we'll do a quarterly upload of the data. It will be all HIPAA redacted, and we're just looking for key parameters like Kmax, steep axis, flat axis, and those KPI indicators. Um, so pretty much it's done remotely. There's no extra work on your part. The software is pre-programmed between TopCon and Glocos and should be pretty transparent. Awesome. When does the program expire, Norm, if you'll take one more? Um, it's earmarked to be a two-year program, so we don't really have a hard stop date on it. So right now it's open from now till the next year or two. Great. I'm going to answer this next one live. Uh, the instrument sounds great, but it doesn't give us posterior corneal curvature. Wouldn't a pentacam 
be a better uh, technology here? Is this fine for just late stage KC? I think that's a fair question here. You know, we have both topography and tomography in our practice. Uh, Pentacam, I'm a big fan of. I showed some scans of Pentacam and how I use it. I think topography is going to give us the hints and the keys that we need for 90 to 95% of patients. And sometimes the Pentacam can really be the tiebreaker for us, but we use both in our practice. Uh, the price point is going to be much different here uh, as well. And so depending on what you're willing to add to your practice, I think both can be utilized and both are great technologies. It just depends on, on what your specific needs are. All right, we are running right to five o'clock. So thank you everybody for attending. I'd like to thank Dr. Mitch Eibach and all of you for attending our webinar. Again, if you're interested, please email us at that iDetectKC at glucose.com or glucose directly. And this concludes our webinar. Thanks everybody, good night.